Thank you for listening to this recording introducing you to the study as interested parties. I'm Dina Zoe Luigi and I'm recording this as an introductory presentation to orient you to the study, to the external advisory board members and the partnering organisation from whence the interest grew. I'll of course also introduce the central questions around which the project pivots and also the processes planned to explore those questions, what I hope to hear from you as external advisors when you have the time and what I hope the study will contribute. The study is supported through my employment at Queen's University Belfast, the partnership with a migrant and minority ethnic think tank and financial support through a grant awarded by the Leverhulme Trust and the British Academy. The title of the study is Provisional, Academic Research Responsiveness to Ethnic Minorities and Migrants in Northern Ireland. It's very much attempting to understand a phenomenon situated in Northern Ireland about those minoritized within it, specifically those who fall within the terms or categories ethnic minorities and migrants, which may or may not have similarities with those minoritized in other parts of the world, particularly but are not only those racialized within majority white post-colonial context. However, the issue of academic responsiveness is one that extends beyond the boundaries of this context and where my contributions as a critical scholar of higher education transformations lies. This is a concern with the responsiveness of institutions, disciplines, and of individual academics to those issues and populations in their contexts. This is the public facing abstract for the project. And what I've written is that migration, race, and ethnicity, majority minority dynamics, are all established areas of academic inquiry in many parts around the world. But that in one region of the United Kingdom, that of Northern Ireland, these are significantly understudied when it comes to local populations and issues. So this study seeks to comprehend why this is so by exploring how such localized research inquiry is constructed perceived and impacted by various stakeholders who influence Northern Ireland's higher education ecology. I then give a sense of the research design, outlining the collected data about relevant research, awards and outputs will be triangulated with primary data generated from questionnaire responses and semi-structured interviews with the academics. Also with institutional research developers, policy makers, members of governmental and non-governmental bodies who have a relation to universities and to the underserved populations. It's hoped that this will enable comprehending the complexities of the internal and external factors which shape research structures and cultures and their, in, their relation to enabling or constraining the agency and practice of academic actors. What has already emerged is the role played by academic identity. I have no doubt that much will emerge in the small study that will be enriched from the input of the external advisory group. Members of this group were invited for their expertise, their interest in cognate issues, the capacity to challenge me and the research team in productive and transformative ways, and in some cases for the future potential of studies, collaborations and conversations. Thank you to each person for the willingness to be part of this journey despite the time and energies it takes from your own concentrated work. Within the island of Ireland, I'm pleased that Joy Tendai agreed to be on this group. Joy Tendai is a barrister in the Republic of Ireland and also a justice, diversity, equity and inclusion advocate, exercised in a number of ways, including in public discourse in the media, where she publishes a bi-weekly column focused on societal, educational, human rights, historical and current issues. Zimbabwean born, she was the founder of Roots in Africa and Ireland, a civil society organization, and is a mentor to many of us on the island. Colette is a lecturer in social care at the School of Business and Humanities at the Dundalk Institute of Technology. She's the author of the book, Child Protection, Social Workers and Asylum Seeking Families in Ireland, Issues of Race, Culture, Power, Relations and Mistrust. Dixon is an international advisor and consultant on research initiation and project implementation. He held an honorary visiting research associate title at the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Peace, Security and Justice, and is an ex-visiting researcher at the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work at Queen's University, Belfast. 
which is where I met and interacted with him. Gift is a barrister and solicitor having qualified in Nigeria. She's a master's degree in gender, sexuality and human rights from Keele University and recently was awarded her doctorate at Queen's University, Belfast. She's a qualified CMI Foundation Chartered Manager and a member of the Socio-Legal Studies Association of UK. Gift, myself and another colleague, Dr. Kalu, have initiated a collective, the African Scholars Research Network, this past year and are members of AFSAI, the African Scholars Association of Ireland. Jason is a professor of education in Glasgow and a trustee of the Runnymede Trust, the UK's leading race equality think tank. He holds various appointments that bridge the research policy gaps with an anti-racist approach which builds on policy and community interventions. Jason's been a collaborator of projects and publications with me and has been a very generous mentor since the early days of my arrival in the UK. Toma researches the norms and practices of the contemporary world of work, with a particular interest in academia and the working lives of migrant academics in the UK. She's based at Cardiff University, and I've been thankful for her critical input in a recent study I undertook on inequalities in academic staffing in UK universities. Mohammed is a Sudanese academic based in the UK. He is currently an associate tutor and content developer with Essex University Online. I met Mohammed when he was living in Belfast for a period, and we've continued interactions as academic peers for the past three years. Kath is a deputy director of the Centre for the Enhancement of Learning and Teaching at the University of South Wales, and has done much work related to the University of Sanctuary and also ethnic minorities in Wales. Kath is a Cornish decolonial scholar, who I know through work we undertook with the Syrian programme for the Council of At-Risk Academics. Andre is the Chair of the Critical Studies of Higher Education Transformation at Nelson Mandela University, to which I am affiliated. He is also the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Engagement at that university. We have been collaborating for the past three years on building a network across the Global South and Excluded North to advance the field and practice of critical university studies. Najma is the Curriculum and Teaching Unit Head at the University of the Witwatersrand working on projects relating to establishing the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, or SOTL, and program redesign. She is a member of the National Advisory Council on Innovation and at international level is a mentor on the Open Education for a Better World program. We have co-authored papers related to the responsiveness of university communities to the Pivot Online during COVID and the perspective and agency of those in academic development, of which Kath has co-authored too. Akona is an early career researcher looking at black academics' leadership choices in the Eastern Cape of South Africa in a doctoral program for academic and professional staff that connects Rhodes University, where she is based within the research office, to the University of Forte and Queen's University, Belfast. Chris is a professor of education at the University of Washington, Tacoma in the United States and a professor extraordinarius at UNISA. He's a critical race theory practitioner, educator, writer and runner, who when describing his raison d'etre to me explained that he collaborates to nurture loving educators with a strategic fiery passion to transform, decolonize and otherwise recreate the educational systems our melting world needs. Nandita is based at the School of Women's Studies Jadavpur University in India. Her areas of specialization include gender and intersectionality, higher education, urban restructuring, the new middle class, intimacies and domestic violence. She's been the principal investigator of a research project in collaboration with myself titled Transformation Towards Sustainability in Higher Education, Interactional Dynamics in Gender and Intersectionality, which looked at institutions and academics within India and South Africa. In addition to those on the EAG is the input from the Migrant and Minority Ethnic Council Think Tank. This is a civil society organization comprised of nominated volunteers from various forms of life who have a demonstrated commitment to migrant and minority ethnic matters and peoples in Northern Ireland. Particularly during this process, presentations, updates and requests for advice will be shared with the board members, some of which you can see pictured on the screen. Members have participated in technical aspects of the process of this project, including informing the selection process for recruitment of the research team. 
all of the MME Think Tank's members are more informed than I, as a person relatively new to the complexities of the context. So a big thanks to Alfred, Aileen, Linda, Morris, Darren and Dalwin for conversations to date and upcoming. It was this group that stirred the first interest in this question of academic responsiveness for me and who are direct partners in shaping the initial steps that informed the study, which I'll discuss now briefly by way of explanation. I was nominated to the council as it was then named in late 2019. I was tasked to coordinate the research related activities with support from Morris and others. This is the page on the website which houses most of my contribution. I highlight it here as it has a direct bearing on the impetus for the study. You'll note on this page a report linked at the top, which we'll talk about in a bit, a block to the bottom left, which links to a group folder in Zotero, or for less jargonized wording, a reference library on an online reference management system with various resources, including academic and gray literature for access by audiences such as members of the public or those constructing policy who are interested in this work and debates. To the right is a list of our research activities. Looking in more detail at this block of the research page, we reformed the Research Policy and Advocacy Consortium as a forum of researchers who have looked into matters related to ethnic minorities and migrants, both based at universities and independent. We started this to facilitate a response to a call by the UK Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities. And we submitted a response. It was a 20 page document with short, succinct responses to the questions posed by the Commission, which we supported by 53 academic references, which we put together with the help of 14 academics, the latter who are referenced in the submission too. We also reached out to various NGO and advocacy groups, but in the end it was the 14 academics who contributed. This of course was not the first time such attempts were made to bring attention to issues related to local ethnic minorities and migrants using formal procedures but it was well grounded in the evidence that is so often cited by those at state level to be lacking from other attempts. And it was also aimed at an audience which had been established to inform policy and as such was following all the processes outlined for impact of research findings. While it was a good interaction for those of us involved, it was completely ignored by the Commission, as I'll discuss in a bit. The so-called Sewell Report, which was produced by the Commission to which we had composed that 20-page response, was released in early 2020. Our submission had been received. We know that because it's listed as a contributor at the end, along with five other submissions from Northern Ireland. However, only one was actively cited, that from the PSNI, which is the police. One reference to a very dated study in the Republic of Ireland, not Northern Ireland, so that brings up issues of validity, which was about travellers' education was included, which was the only reference to academic research about ethnic minorities in the document. We then issued a response to that report, joining the many, many others in condemnation of it. And I think things changed, certainly for me, from that point. A few things or concerns or suspicions were confirmed for me. The lack of political will in England to engage with Northern Ireland issues related to race and ethnic disparities. Also what is being called the problem of methodological nationalism in the UK and how it obliterates difference when convenient and then holds up essentialism when convenient. Neither of which seem to serve addressing the rights, dignity or problems faced by those who fall within the cracks of dominant and dominating political narratives. And then how research too is utilized similarly, lived experience being reduced to anecdote or subjective when inconvenient, academic research demanded for evidence, but then not prioritized within the system and very technocratic when commissioned. I'll explain more about this as we progress, but I began to see not only with this event, but also through discussions, that there were many problematic positionings of research for and by these communities, for want of a better word, because it's really an overused word here in Northern Ireland. And as a higher education scholar, I was also concerned about who was positioned to author such research, because authorship has much reproductive or transformative power. So in discussion with the think tank, 
I applied to Queen's University for a small sum to conduct a review of the items that are uploaded on the university's research portal. The software used is called Pure. They provided me with a sum to employ a research assistant, and here she is named as first author on the report we produced. The funding was provided with the understanding that the process would give us the information needed to create an expert group within the university to research such issues. Outside of that funding, we also looked at other research universities. And so both Queen's University Belfast and Ulster University, which are the research intensive universities on the island, were included. This is the cover of the report. The next few slides are screen prints from it. Limitations were that it was mainly academic research, and actually much has been undertaken by non-academic institutions, independent researchers and groups, and that it included two universities, and only those items recorded on the repositories. Recording is dependent on the capacity and will of individuals to share information in an open access way. The major push for that has been related to UK requirements for open access, and the systemized upload of research outputs for REF, or the Research Excellence Framework, which is a national ranking exercise across the United Kingdom. The first requirement for such processes was started around 10 years ago. The portal also doesn't have allowance for research produced by staff who are not contracted to do research, with a contracted division in the UK between teaching only, research only, and research and teaching positions which means that there may be more research items which weren't uploaded. So it provides really a snapshot. At the time, we find a total of 176 resources recorded on the database. The earliest was published in 1990, with the most recent in 2021. Of those, 72 were published in the last five years. To place this in context in the period when Queen's produced the 88 items we found, 88,410 research items as a whole were recorded. Ulster's 84 items should also be seen in context of the 34,916 research output items. And not all of the items of the 176 are academic publications. Some are additional dissemination such as conference papers, or impact activities such as radio interviews and blogs. What this did indicate overall is that this hasn't been an active area of interest and research investment in the Northern Ireland context. And so we anticipated that there would be gaps and omissions. The report was launched, reviewed, endorsed by public figures and included in the launch was a round table discussion with the think tank. We've drawn from the report to produce policy briefs and presentations such as this policy brief for the Department for the Economy, for instance. We've also engaged in a number of different events. To contextualize this event, I presented on the research report, ending with a discussion or really a provocation. It's just a few minutes, so I'll play the recording for you. So what might these gaps in research mean? Well, they may indicate that there's nothing of academic significance. As I was saying, when you publish, you need to indicate that you're furthering knowledge, particularly academic knowledge. And it may be that these gaps indicate that what is discovered in research is already known, or that none of the phenomena add anything new or significant about this context. But academic knowledge is constructed, and it reflects in what it chooses and in what it omits, the constructions of its authors, its systems, its cultures, and its leaders. So it may be that what is happening is that what might be studied is not considered of interest by those who are powerful, whether that be those who fund research, those who reference research for decision-making, or those within institutions, including academics, don't find it of interest. And this is why the issue of academic composition being democratized is of particular importance. So this idea of disinterest, it may be legitimate, or it may indicate that they must recognize the knowledge of the populations that we're talking about today. It may be that the populations are small or the phenomena too localized. That is, it is overlooked or marginalized as unimportant. It may be also that it's not a salient topic, nor the population influential enough 
to be given consideration nor, nor participation. This may be because there is an active desire to exclude or keep the influence or knowledge as marginal, or it may be because there is not little convergence of interest with those who are garnering power in this divided context. To deepen the discussion about research priorities in this area, I initiated what at the time was an unfunded study about the academic research culture within Northern Ireland universities about such research. It is this now that relates to this project. I began by inviting all those listed in the report as the authors in the research outputs and then also snowball sampling from them. While I prefer interviews, I also created this anonymous questionnaire based on my prior experience of research with academics and participants, and because there may have been suspicions about me being an insider from one Northern Ireland institution and knowing the responses or institutional rivalry. But anyway, in my invite, I encourage interviews. I ask about their motivations and personal experience and also about how they see themselves as migrant academics or locals or minorities, in et cetera, and how they are positioned by the UK government, a sort of why I do this research, and then more general questions about what I've called the research life cycle, to get a sense of what is constrained or enabled the many stop starts, failures, learnings and successes, relationships and impact in doing this research in more broad ways than is envisaged by institutions or the research excellence framework. And then a few standalone questions about how academics have negotiated the discourse of deficit and positioning of ethnic minorities and migrants in Northern Ireland in the research processes and how they believe research about ethnic minorities and migrants in Northern Ireland is perceived in Northern Ireland. I'm midway but needless to say I'm learning a lot. I then became lucky really, now being funded by a British Academy Leaving Home grant. It's enabled me to bring a research assistant on board, Yvonne, who will introduce herself in a bit, who will be assisting me with conducting a systematic analysis of the text produced by academics, looking particularly at methodological issues, methods, the relation and positioning of those migrant or ethnic minorities, the sources drawn upon the orientation of the project's funding, and then also she'll be helping with analyzing the interviews. I'll also conduct more interviews and data collection with the newer authors that have happened since that initial report, but also research developers and the perspective of NGOs or partners named in those research outputs. I'll also be looking to contextualize and theorize the findings and a text related to academic relations to marginalized knowledge, populations, topics the issue of academic identity, consciousness, and the relation of those to research cultures and research development, I guess as part of a process of academic formation, possibly. I'm really looking forward to your input on these issues. I hand over to Yvonne now to introduce herself. Hello, my name is Yvonne Meinhan, and I am a research assistant on the academic research responsiveness to ethnic minorities and migrants in Northern Ireland project. I'm originally from Cork in the Republic of Ireland, and I came to Northern Ireland five years ago. This wasn't a linear move. And in fact, I traveled around quite a bit in my early adult life, and I've lived in continental Europe, in the Middle East and in South America. My career too has spanned many different areas, um, but it was as an English teacher in Barcelona that I developed a deep appreciation for education. And while working um, in grassroots organizations in Peru and in Palestine, that I discovered a deep passion for social justice. While my nomadic lifestyle gave me a certain understanding of what it is or what it was like to be a migrant, it soon became clear to me that as a white European female, I was often afforded certain privileges and courtesies that many of my friends and colleagues from different migrant backgrounds were not. Feeling the need to gain a deeper understanding of these dynamics and ultimately a desire to challenge them is what 
eventually brought me back to Ireland. Firstly, to the University College in, in Cork to study international development and then to Queen's in Belfast to study a master's in conflict transformation and social justice with the George Mitchell Institute. So my master's thesis um, explored the experiences of minority ethnic students in a primary integrated school in Northern Ireland. And this laid the groundwork for my doctoral research which I'm carrying out as a 90 TP student with the School of Social Science Education and Social Work at Queen's. It is a comparative study of the experiences of pupils from migrant backgrounds in the different primary school types in Northern Ireland. It was while carrying out a review of the literature for my study, it became clear to me that there is a dearth of research in Northern Ireland in this area and indeed about people from migrant minority ethnic backgrounds in general, particularly in comparison with the rest of the UK. So I feel very fortunate to be a part of of this project, um, which will explore the reasons for and the contributing factors to this dearth of research. It is very important work and I am very grateful and very excited to be a part of it. Thanks for your time, a reminder of my email, so please reach out with feedback.